And we're live today. It is me, Sabrina Stangler, coming to you in a silly, goofy, quirky mood. Hello, everybody. If you're watching the YouTube video version of this, peep the green screen behind me. It is not a green screen. It's actually my wall. I chose to paint it that color. Thank you for watching. Now, for those of you who are keeping track of time, today is Thursday, August 4th of 2022. And if you saw the title of this piece of media here, you know that I'm going to be discussing the Bachelor season that involved one Mr. Clayton, last name omitted because who cares, and we're going to be rehashing all that shit because I would really, really like to start watching this most recent season of The Bachelorette, which I'm assuming if you click this video or this podcast, as you know, Gabby and Rachel are having their season, their little joint season, and it has taken all of the energy in the world for me not to see all the spoilers, but... I have remained strong. And before I get into that, I am going to go back through all of my notes on Clayton's season. And we're just going to chat shit about it. And I'm excited to see my notes and think like, what do I think months later? How are we feeling? Do I still care? I care enough to make this video. Okay? And today I'm doing it because you might be thinking, Sabrina, you took notes on this. Why haven't you released this sooner? Why haven't you recorded this sooner? That is such a good question. And today, I'm just in a silly, goofy mood. And I think that that is a requirement. And I just have not been in a silly, goofy mood until right now. And so here we go. I actually also recorded a version of this in several months ago. But my recording software decided to say, no, I'm going to delete that. I'm going to act like you didn't even record that. Don't even worry about it, babe. It was no good. And it was good. My thoughts were fresh. My thoughts were hot. So I digress. I'm also going to be reviewing the cast of the season because I realized I don't remember these girls off the top of my head. Like I'm reading these names and I'm like, mm, who are these people? So this is going to be a little bit chaotic, but it will be sequential through the season because I'm going to be going through my notes front to back, top to bottom, starting with the trailer. So with that, I'm going to actually eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because I like to feed myself. And I'll be right back. This is the point at which in a sponsored TV program, I would have an ad. But in lieu of that, you just get to hear me toot doot dooting along to some smooth jazz on my mouth hole. Thank you for that, Sabrina. All right, back to the show. Okay, I'm back. I put a sweatshirt on because it's a little bit chilly. It's a brisk 71 degrees. So thank you, Mother Nature. So I didn't actually write this down, but I felt so passionately about this that I remembered it. So you're welcome. Going into the Clayton Bachelor season, I thought to myself, like many people, why Clayton? Now, something I did not see discussed on the online internets, I didn't dig that deep, so maybe some people addressed it. But what I was thinking was, this is the guy that like, pulled the wool over on kids to get Michelle's like one-on-one -on -one date later that night because Clayton was from Michelle's season, right? Right? We all remember this. So mm, maybe pull the wool over is like an exaggeration, but he was all like, I'm going to make a fort because kids love forts. And then I know that they're going to want to like choose me as their favorite and I'll get to go on the one-on-one -on -one with Michelle. And I was like, no, this feels slimy like at the very least it feels slimy something about it is like very not slay and I just I just want us to keep that in mind because like was that a necessarily bad thing like he's on the bachelorette like he's trying to find love blah 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 like it is normal to do selfish things and it is not necessarily bad to do selfish things like selfish is not inherently bad but it does get into like dicey territory when you're willing to like I don't know it feels like fake the kind of interest and engagement you had in working with the kids just for the purpose of the date like I think that might be a flaw of the show for sure but I it definitely gave me ick like let's say that it gave me ick and so and I just, like, I thought he was a little bit dull. I was like, Clayton's not really giving us personality. 
And so that trend continued into the season, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So that's what I was going into all this with. And then I saw the trailer, and I have three bullet points here for the trailer. One, so they've reignited the drama. Cool. Because they were giving us little spoilers, little teasers, if you will, of all these fights happening and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, that's what we're doing. All right. My second thought was, is that Piper? For those of you who watched the season, I was thinking Teddy. Because they just kind of deliberately didn't really show Teddy's face in the trailer. And so it was like, is this the same, like, small, light-skinned woman with curly black hair too soon to tell it was not piper my third thought i am sick of watching people make out now this is true 100 percent of the time but the trailer must have really had me because i hate the sounds i hope that you can't hear the sounds of like my mouth opening right now on this mic but i almost i get the same thing on tiktok when people use like a little lavalier mic and they're like and you can like hear all the noises that their mouth makes. That's just, just that shit's just disgusting. And also, like, for this, for me to have written this about the trailer, it really grinds my gears, especially when the makeouts are like long and we're seeing a lot of it. Like, I gather that the length of a kiss could be somewhat indicative of like the quality of the kiss or like the strength of that that like relationship at the moment and so i understand why they want to show us it but like can we not amplify the sounds like maybe throw some background music i digress getting into it episode one this was the first season where we had a host officially who was like i'm here i'm not just taisha and caitlin like and they were described as stepping in and i'll get to that in a second but this was jesse palmer and i cannot read this without thinking about kiki palmer so sorry to this man i don't know who you are but i was like bro you better show that you deserve this over caitlin because i was like very pro caitlin i was pro Tasha, i think as well i liked that it was new and i liked that we had a female or two female hosts because like not like chris harrison really added that much in the first place but they then definitely did add things like they weren't just saying a bunch of stupid shit like, oh, that sounds like it's really hard for you, Clayton. Or like, I don't know. I can't even think of something useful Chris Harrison has like literally ever said. And that's just true. Is not is it not? Okay, so this must have been, I, I cited a quote from Clayton where he said, I'm a Midwest guy that doesn't really like the spotlight. And I said, that's so ridiculous. Do you know where you are? Like, do you know what show you're on? I don't believe you. Line number two. First, lying to the kids. Second, lying to us. He's trying to pull the wolver on our eyes now. I am Midwest guy. I'm gonna shut up. And then, oh, football guy. Wow, totally unique. Like, who, what guy hasn't played football? I realize that a lot of them have not. But a lot of the clientele and the cast for shows like this are just so American. They're just so love football, tossing the pigskin. And I'm just sick of it. Like, again, with Clayton not really having a personality, but also being, like, weirdly selfish. I'm anti-Clayton at this point. So, so okay, now getting into the women intros. I said, now watching these after watching the trailer where they were, like, crying and yelling and it was, like, showcasing all this drama. Like, it's making me realize that these are people, that these are whole human beings. And that, one, like we are not our worst moments and two we are only seeing these little tidbits of them and that they are like whole entire people outside of that and that they have interactions with each other and with clayton that are like un they're outside of our vision so like maybe disclaimer for the whole podcast video media which is i'm taking this at face value a little bit and trying to give the benefit of the doubt where I think it's fitting, but like recognizing that like this is a highly produced reality show and that people get like edited to look shit. But sometimes when you say shit things, like you cannot be edited any other way. You know what I mean? Besides edited out because you were so bad. So 
I made a note about Sally. I don't know if that is the right name, but there is someone who came to Clayton the night before, like before the arrivals happened, like the out the like stepping out of the limo and whatnot. And she was like, oh, my God, like, I just, like, need some emotional support. And I was like, speaking of taking the show at surface level, like, this is a game show, more or less, that you signed up for. And you said, yeah, I see those rules and I will follow them. And then you just, like, went and broke them. But I also know that this is, like, I'm not going to act like Sally here is the first person to ever, like, quote, unquote, break the rules on a love-based reality show like the rules are not set in stone blah 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 but i don't like this behavior i like i really don't like when people skirt the parameters of the show and then treat it like well i was just so passionate i was just like so into you and so like i just had to see you blah 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 no it's not fair it's just plain and simple not fair to the people who are actually like trying to be respectful of like what they signed up for and respectful of excuse me of like the other contestants and so I just kind of can't stand that I know sometimes that these women are kind of like emotionally not these women excuse me that sometimes the contestants or the bachelor bachelorette themselves can like become kind of emotionally distraught and I think it is interesting when the bachelor or bachelorette chooses to like go to somebody for emotional support because that's like indicative of you know they had choices and they chose to go with this one person because they felt like the most comfortable or the most safe with them but they're the bachelorette like they are running the show so like that's cool like they kind of make the rules they set the parameters so anyway i'm getting way too into the weeds for this just being like my first few bullet points But this was also the first time that Clayton was like, oh, my God, I think you're so special. Like, I can tell that, like, there's something special between us. Like, I can tell you're great. And I was like, I don't think you can. Like, maybe we're just seeing little ounces of this interaction. But, like, this just feels weird. And it feels so weird for you to be like, I don't know, like, diagnosing the specialness, like, just out the gates like this. Because, and it was weird because he fucking did this so much. And then he gave her a rose. I literally wrote, not a rose. The girls are going to hate it. It's pretty whack. And I don't think he should have done this. Like, he could have just given her a rose later. Like, you didn't have to do it in advance. Because now, like, it's going to upset everybody. And you could be like, this is his show, right? You just said The Bachelor makes the parameters. Yeah. But you also know... That, like, this, you're, like, rewarding them for breaking the rules, you know? And then, like, now you can't act surprised when people break the rules later in the season because you just basically said, like, they don't matter. And actually, I'm going to encourage you to break the rules because you will be rewarded. Stupid. And that did happen with fucking, like, Cassidy or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I have one last thing about the intro to Clayton is that in this interaction, like, it seemed like he was trying to demonstrate that he has like a really high level of emotional intelligence. And I was like, I think you're reciting things that you've seen. Like I don't get a strong sense for you actually having a strong level of emotional intelligence, but rather that you are like patient enough and like potentially calculated enough. But at this point I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like I told you I was anti Clayton and that was true. And it still is true, but my opinion did change, and you'll hear about it soon. So, anyways, that all being said, we get to the limos. So, the girls are stepping out of the limos one by one, blah, 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 super cute. Beautiful dresses, beautiful gowns. And one thing I love during this scene to, like, hyperanalyze is the people who say thank you to the, like, driver who opens the door. When they don't say thank you, I'm just like, "Mm, doesn't sound like you're a nice Midwest guy who doesn't like the spotlight. Do you know what I mean? So, one thing I need to note here about first impressions of one of the women, Susie, she looks like Debbie Ryan, and that's the truth, and I'll say nothing else about it. It's also interesting to see who maintains eye contact during this time, and, like, the way that they touch each other, like, Clayton 
I wrote that he kept patting them on the back when they left, like on the the like lower small part of their back. And that's just weird. That's just weird. Like you just met these women. It's weird. It's really weird. I know some people like make out with the person on their first encounter, but I don't like that either. I'm a hater. I'm a hater of the physical affection. Another little cringe thing here, and I will try not to say this every season, but since this is the first season that I'm recapping, I must say it. Everyone's like, I'm going to be honest. I'm a little nervous. Like, don't hate because I'm like a little nervous. Like, weirdly, of fucking course you're nervous. I know that they're just trying to make conversation and like break the ice. But like, could we think of something more original to say? Apparently not. Another little litmus, if you will, here, in addition to like the way that they like eye contact and touch and interact is the way that the other women react to the other women's limo entrance. Like, they all do a gag or, like, something to be memorable, whatever. One woman came out in lingerie and, like, a doctor's cloak. Cloak. Like, a doctor's jacket. Uniform. It covered her lingerie, but then, like, she was in lingerie. And... uh, Some woman was like, you're already showing him the goods. Like, why buy the cow if you're already going to get the milk? And I was like, this is disgusting behavior. Like, I can't believe that you just said this right now in 2022. Like, the internalized misogyny is just like, it reeks. It stinks. You need to go home. Like, not a slut shaming. So red flag on the person who was in a blue dress and had a short fro. And she's black. I don't know. I'll probably cut that out because it's not really important who it is because they did not last. (laughs) And I wrote, so we've got two groups forming. We have the internalized misogynists and the girl gang. There's always someone from each court. So now the cocktail party. There's apparently no other noteworthy limos that I wrote about. What? So the kissing started here and it was disgusting. And he continued to like touch the women like putting his hand on their legs like I think he put his hand on every single woman's leg and I was like this is a little bit nasty it's just weird I guess like I have not dated really in my adulthood I've been but like I still like interact with people when I go out and like I just would never that's just weird like to just like reach out and grab her fucking leg like just Keep your hands to yourself. And also, like, this night, one, totally lends itself to introverts. So I'm going to stop talking about this first night because it, like, is literally so inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. But it also, like, lays a lot of the groundwork for how the rest, like, how the first, because it cut people, like, the first night. And then the people who make really good first impressions are most likely to get, like, the first one-on-one or to get the most attention during group dates, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, this is a broken system. I see why people skirt it, but it just makes the problem worse. Okay, we have our first abandonee. Her name is Claire, and she was all like, I feel like I would chew him up and spit him out. Like, he's America's sweetheart, blah, 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 blah. Like, leave. She seemed, I wrote, she's also giving drunk vibes, kind of, which I obviously can neither confirm nor deny, but... It was just uncomfortable. And it was like, she's talking all this shit and being like, yeah, I just met Clayton. I realized like he's, he just like could not be the one for me. And I think she really thought she said something. Like she really thought she was talking her shit, but nobody was laughing. Nobody was laughing. So too bad for Claire. Goodbye. So uh, speaking of first night stuff, I wrote that the rose ceremony is, like, really heartbreaking. Seeing the women in the confessionals talk about how, like, it just lights up all their insecurities. Not only, like, literally being compared to other women, but then, like, not even really getting any explanation for why it didn't really work. And so you would love to think, right, that they're, like, just giving it giving the the connection that they had the benefit of the doubt that's like it just wasn't it wasn't a right match but to them like for most of them they're like it felt like a good connection to me they didn't have anything to compare it against in that moment unlike Clayton who has or unlike the bachelor bachelorette who 
who literally has 30 other women to like compare that connection against. And so they end up being like, what do these women have that I don't have? Like, why am I even here? I'm not good enough. And I don't want Clayton to see this version of myself because like, I'm like this version of myself that's like feeling unconfident because maybe he'll like see me as not as attractive as somebody who is confident. And this is again, just like the first night lends itself to the introverts who are confident and or not the introverts who are confident, excuse me, the extroverts who are confident and it just kind of sucks. The last little funny bit about episode one was they did the toast at the end with all the women who made it through the first rose ceremony and one of them was like oh my god girl power supportive group of women like yay friends and then they clipped to scenes of them being like you're just a fake two-faced bitch and I was like this show is so fucking funny this is sad but it's super funny and I appreciated that thank you producers okay episode two this was where I remembered that the bachelor is a franchise or not is it a franchise either way this is where I remembered that the bachelor is like a business obviously and so they profit from promoting things like cities and hotels that you can travel to like tourism is very much part of their business model and so I was sitting here like how do they pick like the people who perform for the couples on like one-on-one dates is it like do the performers pay to be there it's weird so it was at this point too that the teasers started to reveal that like there was this crazy ultimatum at the end or not ultimatum at the end but this moment of a rose ceremony where he was like i'm in love with both of you or and then you see like these three women crying and it was like did you just reveal like literally everything like i know a lot a lot happened in between don't get me wrong but i was like you just like that is giving away the milk Before you get the cow, whatever that idiom was. Okay, so they did a group date on the second episode. And they always do, like, a hug lineup. Like, everybody gets a hug. But whenever they hug, like, they don't look at each other afterwards. Like, they set them down. Like, especially because Clayton is, like, a big, tall man. And a lot of the women were, like, relatively short. He lifts them all up as as they try to promote the, like, oh, my God, big guy, small girl, whatever. But then after they let them down, like, there's no eye contact. That's weird. Like, that is weird. Oh, my motherfucking God. So the group date is with kids. And we've already addressed how I think Clayton interacts with kids. He's all like, this is a test, like, for motherhood or whatever. I had So I just think it's weird. I think. Clayton might have been intentionally trying to be like, no, I do really like kids. Like, don't hate me for the way that I acted on Michelle's season. I really do like kids. And I feel like this was like a test for motherhood as well, which I get it. Like, again, in the spirit of the game and like you're trying to weed people out who don't really fit what you're looking for. Like, maybe just say it. Maybe you don't have to, like, see how they interact with kids in order to, like, tell you if they're a good mother. Like, someone might be really great with kids, but then they're going to be like, I actually don't want kids. Or I don't want kids for another decade. Or I only want one. Or maybe they literally, like, are sterile. Like, I just, I think that this is a bad litmus test. And I think that this enforces a kind of, expectation for women that they're like just supposed to show and demonstrate their motherhood potential from the get like from the jump like it's supposed to be like a woman enters the room and like the kids calm down and like they're just so good with kids and like maybe this is my like personal bias showing but I personally have always thought that this was like really fucking stupid and like problematic and it just made me feel like it's always made me feel like I am not a good enough woman to like be a mother because I can't like calm babies down which is absurd so I have beef with this date premise because I think he could have gone about it like a different way and then the way that the date parameters were enforced was kind of stupid so he had them like planning a party for kids and they were meant to like self-organize on like how the work was going to get done 
And uh, I mean, like, that's cute and all. Like, if you were trying to interview these women to be product managers or project managers, like, this is a great little test. However, you're interviewing these women for relationship potential. So, like, maybe this was a bad idea because then he didn't even spend time with them on this date. Like, he barely spent time with the women. And then Cassidy, realizing that this was stupid, went to take her time with Clayton despite, like, all the other women having to do all the other work. And again, like, Clayton, like, enabled this bad behavior. (coughs) And, like, rewarded it. And I was like, this is stupid. Like, this is obviously a red flag for Cassidy because she's, like, not a team player, not a good sport, like, very selfish. Like, I get it's a game, but it's, like, rude and disrespectful, right? And so, and that she was, like, she didn't really own up to it. She was just, like, or she didn't own up to the fact that, like, what she did was kind of whack. She was just, like, I don't care. Like, I'm not here to plan a party. I'm here to find a husband. And it was just weird. She also said to the kids, I try to spend as little time with you small people as possible. And, like, Clayton. Like, clearly, this little test that you did was not a good one. Because, like, you're all up and over this Cassidy woman, and she doesn't want kids. Like, it's it sounds like she doesn't want kids, right? Like, or she doesn't like being around kids. So, anyway, flop on Clayton's part. So, the cocktail party afterwards, Cassidy continues to be a menace, whatever. I'm not going to apologize for not hanging up streamers. Like, I would be literally so infuriated with Cassidy. But, <clears throat> at this point, I said, if I understand Clayton's values correctly... He's going to send Cassidy home. And then he doesn't. I was like, damn, I clearly misread. I misread Clayton's, like, values. Or he doesn't have a strong sense of his values. Like, he might just be floating through the abyss, like many of us, without a clear idea of, like, what's important to us. So you're like, yeah, kids are, like, important, I think. And, like, honesty, but, like, also sexiness. Yeah. And, like, the attraction has to be there, blah, blah, blah. So, the first one-on-one is with Susie, Miss Debbie Ryan herself. This was cute. And I said, OMG married parents vibes. So cute. What's that like? Would literally not know. So, so as Cassidy paves her driveway out of the bachelor house, she doesn't know it yet, but she's going to leave. She is starting to train up Shanae, who becomes the menace of the season. If you're watching this and you did not, already watched The Bachelor this season. Let me tell you who Shanae is, all right? She is a menace and is doing things for the clicks views and engagement, is willing to lie, is willing to literally do anything to, like, get Clayton time, but it doesn't seem like she actually likes Clayton. So this is kind of a spoiler for a fucking drama arc that spans most of the season, but it's actually a big fucking waste of time, and it's just Shanae being a menace for no reason and then Clayton being like basically ignorant to it he's like believing Shanae when she says she's being bullied even though it's obvious to everybody else involved that that is not the case and she's literally in the diary room being like I lied like I cannot believe that they believed that that acting performance I deserve an Oscar why did nobody from the production team tell this to him? Like, this is one of those times where I feel like maybe y'all should have shared that with him. It was just silly. It was silly, silly, silly. The next group date involved Z-Way and talking about relationship red flags. And I was like, eh, like, that's my bestie. If you've not seen Z-Way on the TikTok, she's fucking hilarious and is kind of known for just, like, telling it like it is in a very funny way. So that being said, They talked about sending nudes or, like, faking orgasms like they were red flags, which I just think is actually so fucking trifling and toxic to be like, oh, you've sent pictures of your naked body? Mm, That's a red flag. Or, like, you faked an orgasm? Like, those are things, like, for one, sending nudes is not a bad thing. If you're, like, consenting to sending those pictures of yourself, like, literally do that. Like, that is your prerogative. It's okay for some people to say, like, that really isn't, like, in alignment with my values, but, like, a red flag and acting like that's, like, a universal truth, disgusting behavior from the Bachelor team. 
no, 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 no. Same with faking orgasms. It's like nobody fakes orgasms because they are like a bad person. Like they fake orgasms because they're not getting like satisfactory pleasure or because they feel like uncomfortable or unsafe in like the relationship that they're having, right? Or they're like, I can't, I don't feel comfortable enough to like maybe explore the sex that we're having to figure out like how I could actually achieve orgasm or like my partner literally just does not care to like give me pleasure that other direction in which case that's not a red flag that like that's sad like that is like a a white flag cry for help like somebody help this woman get her in some therapy so on this group date this is where Shanae starts her tirade towards Elizabeth who is another contestant and basically tries to be like Elizabeth is two-faced and blah 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 and let me just let me summarize the arc that I started to dig into earlier Basically, it starts with Shanae saying, Elizabeth treats me differently, like on the group dates versus in the house versus like in front of you. And I think it's two-faced. I think she's a liar. And she starts to throw around like increasingly more aggressive words about the way that Elizabeth is acting. And it is just completely baseless, absolutely baseless accusations. And the base that she's trying to create that Shanae is trying to create for these accusations towards Elizabeth is that like Elizabeth on the first night said that she was interested in like being friends with Cassidy but it was like or not Cassidy sorry Shanae and that she was be- interested in being friends with, with Shanae and they were talking and blah 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 and they're saying like oh I love you like blah 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 like but love you in like a platonic way and like a oh yes I like love all women here right and so and then she like apparently elizabeth ignored shanae or it literally does not matter but shanae drags this out to the ends of the earth and then is trying like then there ends up being the stupid shrimp gate situation where shanae rudely took too many shrimp but then makes extra shrimp and when people didn't want them she was like, they're awful people. And Elizabeth especially made sure the girls would not talk to me. It's it's ridiculous. It is, the more that I talk about it, the more I'm like, I'm wasting my time and I, you're wasting yours. So I will stop. And the cap to this arc is that Clayton lets this go on for so long until other women step up and start saying like, Shanae is full of shit. And then Shanae's like, you guys are bullying me. And then they're like, no, I think Shanae is actually full of shit. And she's like, the whole house is against me. Like, you have no idea what it's like in there for me, Clayton. And finally, he like kind of catches her in a lie and sends her home. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. Oh, my God. And again, with rewarding bad behavior on this group date where Shanae starts all the drama, he rewards her with the group date rose saying like, Shanae, I'm glad that you can open up to me about this thing that you're experiencing in the house. I wrote grasping at straws here about a million times. Oh, she also, like Elizabeth tried to address this quote unquote feud with Shanae kindly. So Elizabeth is out here being a queen. And so she's like, hey, I just wanted to blah, blah, blah. Make sure that we're cool. And so she tells her, like Elizabeth tells Shanae that she has ADHD. And so focusing on her, like, is not always easy because there's lots of different senses happening in the room, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the specifics, but she tells this to her in confidence that she has ADHD and because of that she struggles with blah, blah, blah. And then Miss Girl Shanae decides that she's about to out like this detail about Elizabeth in front of the whole group. And it was just like, that's not your laundry to air. Like that is actually so disgusting, nasty behavior. So like if she could not get worse, there she just did it. Like, she clearly demonstrated that she has no regard for people at all, besides herself. So now that the Shanae hate train has come and gone, there was this moment later in this episode during the cocktail party where Clayton says something like, you know, Eliza, you didn't get to go on the date tonight, but, like, you're still being so positive about it. And I was like, babe, like, you didn't choose to take her on a date. Like, you were the active participant in the situation so but he was talking about it like oh you just like didn't get to go or like it's a shame that like 
it just didn't happen like very passively but it was like you actively decided that you clown so uh, at the end of the episode during the cocktail party cassidy is still here like i said she's paving her way out but she's not gone yet and she already had a rose from earlier in the episode so she was sticking around but she still came to see Clayton and then Clayton was all like, oh my God, that's so nice that like, even though you already had your spot secured, you came to see me. Like, maybe she's doing the same thing that you tried to do on Michelle's date where she's being manipulative. Okay. And she's trying to manipulate the situation in her favor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The last bit from this episode was absolutely not girl boss behavior. Miss Girl Sienna was listening to Cassidy talk about having like a quote unquote fuck buddy back home. And I do not think it's weird. Like maybe this is controversial, but I think of all the shit Cassidy did, like this is not a bad thing for someone to like have a fuck buddy back home where like if this didn't work out, she was going to go back to her fuck buddy. Like why wouldn't she? Is she supposed to just, like, cut people completely off just for the potential that you might, like, be interested in her? I honestly don't think that that's fair. Or, like, more importantly, I don't think that's any of Sienna's business to be sharing with Clayton. She's acting like, this is just such an important thing. And, like, it just, Clayton, like, deserves to know. And I'm like, you are literally slut-shaming this girl. Like, I cannot cite quotes, but the vibe here was slut-shaming. It was, like, I was like, ew, you have a fuck buddy and you're like, here, oh. Even though they stopped, like they stopped engaging with each other before they started this. Like, what's the issue? Like, Cassidy is clearly not going to stay, but this was not the thing that needed to be the nail in her coffin, in my opinion. Okay. Episode three. So remember what I just said at the end of episode two where I said what Cassidy did is like, not necessarily bad in my opinion when Clayton confronts her after having heard the information from Sienna Cassidy is in like full denial mode she's like that's not true I was not in a relationship like any guy that she's had an interest in a relationship with like I have not been with do you not believe me and uh, I think she might be justified here in like it just really not being anybody's business at this point, like what her relationship situation was before coming on this show, like the details of it. It's like they're trying to make it like it's a big bad thing. And I think because of that, like I think she's justified in playing it down because if it is, if what she's saying is true, that like it was a friends with benefits situation, then like what is wrong with that? Literally nothing, nothing. But this really riles Clayton up. Now Clayton's like, oh my God, I just can't believe anything anymore. And throughout the conversation with Clayton and Cassidy, eventually Clayton like walks away and he's like, I need time to think. And when they come back, Clayton is the one who comes back. Keep this in mind. Cassidy is like being very calculated in the way that she's speaking, like very, very choosy with her words. And then she like fake cries it's not good it looks bad it's bad I didn't write down what the outcome of this was but I've already alluded to the fact that she leaves and I said this is she said this is my acting debut she was she admitted to faking it and I was like this is a great way to get yourself on bachelor in paradise I don't think she ended up being on it maybe she did I don't know that's for another episode So, next, in episode three, they have a group date. They're doing sharing hashtag vulnerability. Clayton is talking about how he was growing up and he was fat and he was like, I turned my weakness into my biggest strength. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how I, they just like must have cut out some of the filler dialogue here explaining like how he turned his like fatness into his strength. I think it might have been having to do something with his like confidence or self-worth that he was like, you know, I used to be really ashamed about my size and people would make fun of me for it. But like maybe I've learned to love myself and come out the other end stronger. But I feel like it's also worth noting if you were someone who did not watch this, like Clayton 
is extremely fit. Like the man is, I'm. He's not like chiseled, but he's like in great shape. Like, like all bachelors, he looks like he goes to the gym. You know what I mean? Or like he has like defined muscles. So, it's just like. Like, I love that we got this conversation here about fat phobia, but we didn't even really dig into fat phobia. And now you're someone who does not experience that prejudice anymore because you're not fat anymore, which isn't to say that you didn't struggle earlier, but it was just like, I feel like we're really gassing this up here. And I just like don't see what's so special or interesting about this because we're really not getting any depth here. It's just like, I used to be fat, very sad, not fat anymore not sad anymore which almost like lends itself to a message that is fat phobic right that's like to be happy I had to be not fat which is not true that is fat phobic so I digress this was weird speaking of more weird behavior from Clayton he was starting to get into this trend of saying like I'm glad you're here because I like what I'm seeing just keep being you and I was like what a weak compliment like Tell me more about how you don't know anything about this woman, but you're just trying to, like, make her feel validated. And for what? It just seemed like he was going through the motions on this show a little bit. And whatever, whatever. One more thing in Shanae's arsenal for, like, these girls are fake is because they were, like, becoming friends and getting excited when each other got a one-on-one. -on -one. And she was like, that's fake because, like, why would you be happy about another woman getting a one-on-one? -on -one? And it's like, this is kind of a zero-sum game where, like, someone else getting a one-on-one -on -one does kind of mean it is a detriment to you. That being said, like, being salty, being bitter, and being upset about it is, like, not useful. Plus, as I alluded to, like, we're only seeing slivers of these interactions, and these women are actually spending days with each other. Days. So this is, like best friend love island for them when it's not clayton time so it's really not weird that they would become friends with each other even when like the show is being recorded and it's like a cocktail party like clayton is only talking to one woman at a time so like they have all this time to sit and talk to each other <clears throat> next we have a one-on-one -on -one date that was particularly funny they were doing a scavenger hunt in downtown la in their underwear whatever this isn't the interesting part but he says, Clayton says in the confessional about the state, it was just a very fast moving date. And I think if we can get through this, then we can get through anything. And I was like, have you ever been in a relationship before? Like, oh, we've like exposed our bodies out in the public. Like now our relationship can go through anything. Like, I don't think that you know what you're talking about because those things just do not align. And when I said Clayton was going through the motions, I wrote something here about how it sounds like he's describing what he should feel and like what he you know like thinks he should be feeling but it doesn't sound like he's actually feeling it like throughout this season we don't get a lot of like emotions from Clayton almost none it's very like analytical emotional intelligence where you're like what's going on here like for some reason something about this is like it's just simply not slay. Like I said, he's not slay. Damn. To demonstrate how irrelevant Shanae's shrimp situation was, I gave it a single bullet with no explanation. That, but that being said, that shit was all living up here rent free for you to for you to understand now. Okay, next in episode three, we have a beach group date. Ooh, I noted that Gabby had the most serve of an outfit. Good for Gabby. I noted that someone named Melina. Let me go find her picture. Melina 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 okay I said Melina is super funny where has she been we don't really see from see or hear from Melina ever again bye Melina thank you for your time during this time Shanae continues to be a flop like I'm putting in the work where's my reward as though this is a game it kind of is but it's not really can't really expect the blah 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 at this point too this is episode three now and Clayton finally realizes that Gabby is funny. If you were a watcher of the show, you would know that it was so fucking obvious how funny Gabby was from the jump.
from the limo scene, like it was so clear that she was a jokester and that she was really good at it. And so he finally is like, oh my God, I wrote a quote. Gabby is so quirky. I didn't know she had that in her. Maybe you should start paying attention, Clayton. Consider it. Also, at the cocktail party after this, I made a note that Shanae clearly has self-esteem issues. I am not a licensed therapist. I won't pretend to be. But that was just my read. Take that as you will. Episode four. Very much Shanae energy episode four. Very annoying. Her name is written here almost way too much. So let me try to summarize. I'm so bored reading through these notes. Like... I'm really not enjoying myself reading about Shrimpgate. I think it was at this point that I was like, I don't know if Shanae is being calculated or if she really thinks that she's in the right. It was very, very unclear. And if she really thought she was in the right, like the amount of mental gymnastics that Miss Bestie was having to do. I mean, she fucking t- walked Clayton through the mental gymnastics. And for some reason, he was like, mm, I believe you. So maybe it wasn't all that crazy. But it was. And I made a note that her diary rooms are honestly hilarious. Like her, her con- like Sinead's confessionals. Because it's like she's built up this story and this like understanding of what happened so much that maybe because of that, now she actually believes it to be true because she's just like convinced herself. Which is a weird in-between of those two choices that, again, I only took one psychology class. Like, I really don't know how that shit works, but it was just wild. I think at the very least, the part of Shanae's behavior that was calculated was that she knew she would get airtime from igniting drama and, like, saying sassy, dramatic shit. Especially in the diary room where she has no repercussions. Like, the producers are not even telling Clayton what's going on in the diary room. When she's saying, I lied, I acted, this is ridiculous. Like, I am i can't believe that they believe me. And at the, at the end of the day, Shanae, like, went to the grave with this one. Like, she is going down swearing that she is in the right and that she's saying the truth. <laughs> Even though she said she lied. Like, babe, they're going to watch it back. Like, what do you... It, grasping at straws, truly. And during this, I was like, I really want to blame Clayton for not, like, figuring it out when it feels so obvious to us, the viewer. But also, like, he shouldn't be having to deal with this. Like, someone who is just purely digging up drama just for the shits and gigs of it. So, like, he probably is assuming the best in Shanae. And it's one of those rare times where, like, he really shouldn't be. But how is he supposed to know that, you know? Okay, next, we have a one-on-one between Rachel and Clayton. Rachel, as we know, is one of the bachelorettes for this current season of summer 2022. I did not like them. When I first saw them go on a one-on-one, I was like, this is cringe and I'm not having fun. And it just felt uncomfortable. And I wrote ick like 10 times. That said, there were times during this where I really felt for Rachel because she was talking about having like a really unsupportive ex because Rachel is a pilot. And so pursuing her career means frequent travel and that like her, that like for a a couple, for her to be in a couple and for them to prioritize her career would mean that like the other person's career would have to be deprioritized, right? And so her ex prior to that was like really unsupportive and made her feel like shit and she was describing this to Clayton and said I don't want to scare you away by the fact that like I was hurt by this person and that is just so sad and on the flip though and similar almost similarly to like add to the skewed understanding of like what what like love is or should be or what a relationship should be she says I don't want love to be conditional now This is something that I vehemently disagree with because I think love absolutely should be conditional because on the opposite end of the spectrum, like if someone is hurting you actively, you like you might love them, but you should and do have every right to say, 
this is not like a relationship that's serving me and it's not safe for me. So like despite the fact that like I want to love them and I want to like turn my love into action here by like being a supportive significant other for them, like they are hurting me and so I'm going to withdraw my love. And I think that's true out of romantic relationships, familiar relationships, etc. If you disagree, argue with my green screen wall. Thank you. And during this time, like Clayton was cute or whatever, he said like the things that you would want to hear if you were Rachel in this situation. Like, yeah, like I'll always support you. And she's like, that's everything I've ever wanted. And he's like, I'll never dim your light. But like. I don't think that either I don't think that Clayton is really grasping the reality of what it looks like to have your career at odds with your partner's career and to say like we as a couple are going to decide to prioritize your career. That is a like dicey and sticky situation. Like I have been there and it's weird and uncomfortable. It like challenges you in ways that you are like not prepared for. So it just feels like it was just words. Okay, next to group date, there was some nasty product placement of omitted title cars, which was dumb, stupid show stuff. They were playing football, and the football group dates are the sport group dates on The Bachelor where it's women competing are always funny because there's always people who care and there's people who don't care like there's people you know they care because they want to like win the group date and be able to go to the cocktail party later but they're like I don't like football I'm not like enjoying the sport so like it's just like not really a fair competition and it's just like it's goofy it's funny it's like watching peewee football Shanae crushed the group date blah 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 who cares Clayton rewarded it as per usual. I wrote Clayton keeps fumbling the bag on sussing out Shanae. And it's true. Anyway, enough of that. On to episode five. Now at this point, Clayton and Serene have a one-on-one. -on -one. Serene ended up on Bachelor in Paradise, if I remember correctly. So at this point, this was like our third one-on-one. -on -one. Susie, Rachel, Serene. No, there's also, there's one other woman in there. She doesn't make it far, so don't worry about her. But it was at this point that I said, I don't think I've seen him really be comfortable with anyone yet. Like, it always feels like he's still putting on this, like, cool guy facade, like, what he thinks he should act like. And I decided that that was going to be my litmus test moving forward was when I felt like he actually started to be himself around somebody. Of course, yeah. And I said, I don't think he has chemistry with Serene. Like, the just watching this is awkward. And, like, one particular bit of dialogue that was, like, so unsettling was Serene asked actually a really good question. She said, what's something you're wondering about me that you feel like I'm holding back? What a good question. And then Clayton just basically says, like, well, there's a lot of mystery and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm trying to know what's behind that smile. Like, is there more behind that smile? Because, like... You're just so cheery and like what's behind there and it was like such a non-answer bad 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 cool guy facade very stupid i also made a note here that clayton's smile is terrifying and if you watch the show you would know what i'm talking about he opens his mouth so far and like hangs his teeth like apart from each other is ah it was just sorry to clayton but your smile made me incredibly uncomfortable more Shanae drama who cares okay the rose ceremony Shanae makes it through people's jaws are literally on the floor women are in tears and uh, and yeah when I begun this journey on the podcast I intended to track all the people's red flags so right now I've got a Shanae red flag count update and I said she says something problematic every time she speaks so her red flags are through the roof and uh, yeah like past sabrina really spilled here okay so our next one on one is gabby gabby is also one of the bachelorettes of this most recent season and i wrote 
chemistry here question mark question mark question mark clearly i saw something here between clayton and gabby i also bias check i loved gabby like i was a big gabby stan like gabby is someone i like that i liked and so maybe i falsely understood their chemistry but i think that they they had chemistry for sure and Gabby was our Miss Therapy Girl boss because she was talking about how she was, like, afraid to receive love and she didn't feel like she was worthy or deserving. And she talked about her self-image and blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, oh, my God. I said she claims to have done a lot of work and it shows. Like, Girly has clearly made the most out of therapy. And then I noted that his smile looked less scary here while he was talking to Gabby. So... Mm -hmm. interesting okay so the next group date was the famous roast where the women write roasts as like jokes like a comedic stand-up skit bit yeah and i wrote that marlena was very funny i was rooting for her she did not make it clayton just did not appreciate her but she was really good sarah who was the notably youngest woman there roasted mara or mara mara like marinara yes i think sarah was funny but then like just started making old woman cougar jokes and went a little too far with talking about her gap tooth in my opinion and then mara tried to roast sarah back i like wish they did not have the same name basically and Mara's roast to Sarah, where Mara is like one of the oldest women, and then Sarah is one of the youngest. Mara says something about her being young and blah, blah, blah. And it was funny. And then she follows it up with, just go home, you desperate bitch. And I was like, mm, that wasn't funny. Like, that just sounded vindictive. <laughs> and it was not, it was just, I'm not trying to say it was mean. And like, maybe it was, but it was just like, when you heard it, you were like, mm, that wasn't funny. And then Mara actually had a little red flag here in the confessional. She said, Sarah is not wife material. She's not wife age. And I have to say that I hate that. That's actually really nasty behavior. Very not girl boss, very not slay. To suggest that someone is like not ready for a serious relationship because of their age when they are like a consenting adult, I think is out of line, out of pocket, and a little bit, bear with me here, a little bit misogynistic because I do not think that she would say the same thing about a young guy. Maybe I don't agree with what I just said, but it was fucked up because like, that's just like not your business. Like, it really felt like she was just like pushing another woman down to like boost herself up. That was the energy that I got, and I did not like that. So the cocktail party after the group date roast, Marlena was really putting in work, talking about vulnerability, and I was really rooting for her. I was, and she just, like, was not getting the click suits and engagement that she deserved. At this point, I thought that he and Rachel did have good chemistry, and they were the only ones who were, like, tongue kissing. So take that as you will. And then she got the group date roast. I think the last... No, this isn't the last part of this episode. This is a long-ass episode. Wait, was this episode five? Okay, at some point, my notes here turn into episode six. But I think we're still... I think we're still in episode five here. When... Oh, when Clayton has a two-on-one with Shanae and Genevieve. Okay. Okay, so at this point in episode five, we get to the Shanae, Genevieve, and Clayton two-on-one. The two-on-one just means it's two girls, one guy. In this case, because it's The Bachelor. And I don't even know why I got into this, because it's just going through the Shanae drama. Finally, Clayton comes to his senses after a long-awaited... This was just dumb. I just, I'm sick of talking about this. At this point... As well, we get the spoiler that it's Rachel, Gabby, and Sarah at the end, and someone drops a bomb, and someone... Okay, I think we're in episode six now. So, Mara continues her red flags of being like, these other girls are more like girlfriend material. 
you know, not wife material. And I was like, not her tearing down other women to boost herself up. Like, that's so yikes. And then we have another one-on-one, Clayton and Teddy. So Teddy got the first impression rose. Her and Clayton had a lot of good chemistry. And they, at this point, were in, like, Croatia. And they were, like, horseback riding in the mountains. And it was just beautiful. And then Clayton has the nerve to say, wow, we can have fun doing just anything. You are on, like, a magical vacation. Of course you're having fun. It was another one of those, like, pulling, like, extrapolating what's happening into, like, what a real relationship would be like. And it was just, like, not, it like, that doesn't make sense. But either way, this is a cute date. There is a second one-on-one in Croatia, and it's Sarah. Sarah is the young woman. Mera is very upset. She is the older woman. And Mera then on the group date continues her bullshit. That is her third red flag. She said something like, these peasants got nothing on me. And these women are not as good as me. And the other women are bland and boring, unlike myself. Very not girl boss behavior. Then there was the cocktail party, which at this point, okay, so now Rachel has had a one-on-one and uh, they're starting to like get that more chemistry, like I mentioned. And then Rachel basically pours her heart out to Clayton and Clayton just says, thank you. Like you didn't want to give her anything. You didn't give her, you gave her scraps. You gave her nothing. You gave her an empty fucking plate. I'm not trying to say that he should have been like, yeah, I'm like falling for you too. But like, maybe say literally anything about the way that you feel about her. Like maybe communicate your emotions, Mr. Emotional Intelligence. Hmm, interesting. Another highlight of the cocktail party, Mara tries to like tell Clayton that these other women aren't wife material. And then Clayton rightfully is like, how do you know that these other women aren't open and ready for marriage? And Mara's like, some of them have been vocal about it and others are just age. And... And Clayton basically reads this as like, I know you're talking about Sarah. And then she's like, yeah. And I don't mean to offend you. I'm just like speaking my truth like I always have. And then Clayton folds. He completely folds. And he did all the work just to like stand up for the other women and then folded at the last second. And just embarrassing, embarrassing behavior from him. Like he has a terrible read across the board on like, trifling behavior at this point as well Susie gets like a special kind of like late night date card that I don't think is like it was like outside of the bounds of the of the parameters of the bachelor and but it was good it was good for Clayton and Susie Susie's like oh my god I'm falling in love with you and then Clayton says he could see himself falling in love at least he communicated his feelings this time you know we have a Gabby green flag Mara older woman talking about Sarah younger woman to Gabby and Gabby like noticeably got the ick when Mara was like talking and being like I don't think she's ready for marriage but she was just like I'm just not along and and act like I'm listening because I don't want to keep talking to you so okay now so now Sarah and Clayton have their second one-on-one so if we remember Clayton folded when Mara was talking about how Sarah's not ready for marriage so Clayton kind of like addresses this with Sarah and says someone told me that you're not ready for what I'm looking for and like yeah I I kind of doubt it do you see that there's a very real possibility that you could be engaged soon and Sarah is like upset she's big time tears very sad she starts pouring her heart out and basically being like it is the absolute opposite like I have been vulnerable and I wouldn't be here if I didn't want you and if I didn't see a future with you And Clayton's like, thank you for being vulnerable. They throw this V word out like it is hard candy on Halloween. It is just all over the place. And like sometimes it fit, a lot of times it didn't. At this point, it seemed like Sarah was totally not in the wrong. But later, it was like, it was very weird. Let me get into it. So episode seven. Sarah addresses the entire group after like because Clayton is saying some people said that you're not ready for marriage and so Sarah goes to address the group of women maturely I might add and says like hey people said this and 
I think that that was inappropriate. And and she didn't even like call somebody out to be like, I want you to come forward and apologize. She was just like, what you did was disrespectful. And think about that. And then Mara like literally doubled down, except for not even to Sarah's face, like in the moment. She said it later. So as Sarah is addressing the group, like Mara is silent. It's crickets from her. And then later, I don't remember when, but I wrote that Mara is a coward. And I think I stand by that. So this situation, even though I'm like very pro Sarah in this moment, this does evolve into a situation with Sarah where Sarah is being a little bit braggadocious about her relationship with Clayton and how like things are just going so well because now she's got two one-on-ones and she ends up sharing some tidbit like we cried together or like Clayton cried during one of our dates and like yeah our relationship is just going so well and it was making some of the other women in the house feel like they didn't really stand a chance because she's like telling all this detail that oh my god there's just a motorcycle that went by scared the shit out of me but so she's telling all these details that like nobody's really asking for and the other women are like how do I stand a chance because it sounds like these like they're basically engaged at this point you know like they're just so close like that's just not where my relationship with Clayton is and so eventually this situation evolves into that the way that they tell this in the show is a little confusing but i want to point out that it is extremely distinct from mara making these ageist comments about sarah and so in this evolved situation mara eventually becomes like a bit of an evangelist for the other women in the house who are like starting to feel bad because sarah is being overly confident but the way mara says it she's like you know, confidence is great, but overconfidence is not cute. So it'd be better for you to go back to the quiet, cute confidence. Like, that just is dripping with misogyny, and it's disgusting. It sounds like she may have been kind of on point, but saying, like, quiet, cute confidence, like, we like quiet women, women who don't make too much noise. Like, that is rooted in misogyny, and I just won't stand for it. Or I just, like, won't let that go un undiscussed. And for what it's worth at this point, we're seeing Sarah be pretty boastful in the confessional like diary room. So it's not like totally out of pocket here. You are. Okay. Now at this point, we have to be in episode six. And Susie gets a second one-on-one as well. Genevieve is still here. You probably haven't heard me mention her very much except for one of the Sinead dramas. But Genevieve is here. She still hasn't gotten a one-on-one. It's very sad for her. She's not going to make it. It's pretty obvious. And it's very sad to, like, keep dragging along people, I think, at this point when you haven't, when you're starting to double up on -on one-on-ones. Maybe just start slicing and dicing. Like, if you know, then you know. So the Susie Clayton one-on-one is them going shopping, and it's like, them going somewhere and she gets to like get whatever she wants and she's like oh my god I've like never had someone take me in a shop and let me get whatever I want and I was like I'm sure that he's not paying for this like the show is paying or literally nobody is paying because the store is getting promotion out of this so I was like that's a really cute sentiment but like I don't think that he deserves the (laughs) like the praise that you're giving him during the state I got to read on Clayton that I was like, I think he would be a really caring and supportive, like really great kind of a sidekick partner to someone who is like really funny and entertaining and ambitious. But like I said, we're not really getting a lot of interesting things out of him, but he is reciting the DSM-5 verbatim. His emotional intelligence scores are apparently off the chart, whatever. So... And when he was with Susie, it was very cute. I wrote, very cute. And celebrating you for being the individual that you are, that is what makes me happy. That's cute. That's cute. And I second that I think that they have real chemistry here. And one of the reasons that I felt this way is because on their date, we got a pretty lengthy flow of unedited talking between them, presumably unedited. It really seemed like it because you can tell when it's like chopping back and forth. But this was like, it looked like a comfortable conversation. 
for like the first time that we've seen all season. Okay, update now. Another one-on-one gets awarded and it goes to Serene. Very sad for Genevieve. The girly is not going to make it. So then the group date occurs, you know, before the last one-on-one and everyone has a couples therapy session, which I thought was a very cool date idea. And it was a green flag for me with Clayton. And that said, this is like asking them to like really, really open up and pry their souls apart in therapy. Like, I would not have wanted to do this this early in like any of my relationships. And just because somebody isn't like super far along in their like self-discovery and like self-realization, self-actualization journey does not mean that they're not necessarily ready for a relationship. Like I don't agree necessarily with the sentiment that you like need to love yourself before you love somebody else. I think that those things can be done in consequence. I do think that they need to be worked on deliberately and separately. And everybody has a different experience of that, blah, 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 blah. But this was like the nail in Genevieve's coffin because she was like, I haven't gone to therapy for a reason because I don't like talking about things that make me cry. That's very sad. Yeah. This all being said, I think this also is fair for Clayton to say like he wants somebody who is at least at the point where they're willing to do this internal work because it sounds like he probably has done some and so I don't know I don't know if that's cool or not let me know what you think in the comments on the YouTube video I don't think you can comment on the podcast the one weird thing here though was that we like were like I know that the whole point of this is that we're watching it But watching their therapy sessions was what really felt weird because I was like, this should not be broadcast. Like, this is very personal and intimate. And like, I just feel like I shouldn't be seeing this. In the midst of here, we saw Gabby flexing her therapy muscle and she's just, she's just so good. So during Genevieve's couple therapy, she was really, really struggling to open up. Clayton said, if she can't tear these walls down, we can't move forward. And then he pulls her aside privately and sends her home. I think he did this respectfully, all things considered. That being said, I don't think that this is good for Genevieve. Like, it's not Clayton's responsibility to, like, manage her well-being because she's, you know, her own autonomous person. But I was like, she is going to pop these walls right back up. Very sad for Genevieve. But this was also the first time that Clayton was like, yeah, I'm going to send you home right now. I wish he would have done this more and done this sooner earlier in the season. Would have saved us a lot of time. Uh, during this, we kind of had a weird little a weird little red flag from Sarah. She was like talking about therapy and saying like, I really love therapy. But it was weird. It was like. For some reason, I feel like you're putting on a front right now. And then it was true and correct because the group therapist was like, after all the sessions had happened, she was like, some people were honest and some people were performative. And I was like, gag. And at this point, Clayton was shocked. And I don't think the group therapist said who it was ever. So it was up to like Clayton to figure it out. And then Clayton starts the group or the cocktail party after this group date by pulling Rachel and he says like I know it's not you so like let me know what's up this is when Rachel finally says like Sarah's being really braggadocious and manipulative and uh, Teddy and Gabby both corroborate that and then when Clayton brings this up with Sarah Sarah denied denied denies I feel thrown under the bus Clayton's starting to get really confused And then Sarah's all like, I've listened to the other girls cry. I feel like I'm not allowed to feel like anything I say is wrong. I just wanted to leave at one point. And uh, Clayton says, I feel like you were just trying to fake cry to me. It didn't seem genuine at all. And I collapsed on the fucking floor. I was like, all of a sudden Clayton has like a good read of people. I'm astonished. And he like 
confronts her and he says, like, I think you might be manipulating other women into wanting to leave because <clears throat> because of what he heard from Rachel, Teddy, and Gabby, that she was being, like, extremely braggadocious. And I wrote down, finally, Clayton has a backbone and a bullshit detector. Sarah is, like, really trying to Hail Mary this all the way up to the point of being walked to the limo. And he's like, I just, I don't believe you. And if I can't trust you, then I can't be in a relationship with you. And I was like, period. And Sarah, but Sarah's, she, like Shanae, she went to the grave with what she was saying. She said, in the limo, totally alone, well, with the drivers, obviously. But so in the limo, she's like, if you're insecure about your relationship because of me, then how is that my fault? Like, I wouldn't want to be with someone like that who listens to, like, the other women and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, girl, you don't make sense. You're not making sense. I have several question marks here. You sound like a clown. Okay. And then lastly, oh, we're in episode seven now. I must have missed that note. Anyway, end of episode seven. Serene and Clayton have their second one-on-one. Nothing noteworthy. Serene says, I'm falling in love with you. And, oh, this was sad. Oh, my God. This rose ceremony, Teddy got axed teddy was the first impression miss chemistry and she got axed so at this point we were down to Susie, serene rachel and gabby at this point Susie and serene have each had two one-on-ones no maybe just serene and at this point as well i made a note and i said i don't know if i was just high or what but i finally felt like i saw clayton with a personality and i felt like i could see why people like him finally at episode seven after several hours of watching this man interact with people i was like you know what i think i understand i get it okay buckle up because now episode eight is hometowns where clayton visits the women's hometowns and meets their family so he meets Susie in virginia Susie does jujitsu. That's very fierce. And she used to have issues with her body, but now she sees her body as a weapon. That is extremely fierce, extremely slay, an incredibly girl boss of her. She talks about her dad, blah, blah, blah. Meeting her family, like, she's got a very classic dad with dad jokes and the whole lot. Clayton notes that Susie is just really uniquely incredible. It's very cute. And uh, the dad is like, we trust whatever Susie wants. Like, if she thinks you're a good man, then we think you're a good man, too. And very cute. I said, I'm Team Susie. This was very cute. Next, we have Gabby in Colorado. They go hiking because what else is there to do in Colorado besides hike? I don't know. That's all I've ever done there. That's not true. But anyway, Clayton is still just really liking that she makes him laugh. And everyone knows that she's the funniest woman alive. You never know what she's going to do next. And I thought that this was a really nice read. Then they were in a hot tub in the mountains, and I was like, I have just been zapped from reality. Like, what is going on? So Gabby's family, Gabby's family was funny too, and basically I got good vibes for this as well. Gabby said she was falling in love, and Clayton was like, oh my god, there it is. Like, I've been waiting, and now he's finally done a good job of, like, reassuring the women when they're saying that they're falling in love even though he doesn't say it back and this is just the gag of the fucking century when we get to the next episode so keep that in mind he is not validating his feelings to any of these women but he's validating their feelings toward him he's like yes you guys are falling in love with me that is so cute and awesome and excellent of you next he goes to serene's hometown in oklahoma city they do some obstacle course and Clayton says, a relationship is like an obstacle course. It's tough and scary and emotions get involved. And I said, okay, shut the fuck up. I was sick of Clayton at this point. They did some big free fall off the top of the course. And they said, taking the plunge into love. And I wrote, oh my God, kill me. Serene's family's cool. The brother was being super real and being like, is he going to stick around one time? Because it get hard, you know, like do you really love her? And like, how am I supposed to know that you're not going to hurt her? And uh, it was very sad, like to see the brother be like, I've seen you get hurt before. Like I've been on the phone with you up till 3am crying. And I just like, don't want this to be that again. And then Serene said that she was in love with Clayton. Big wow. So now that is three women who are falling in love or in love. 
Now for our fourth last living girl boss, Rachel. They go kayaking. They're very touchy-feely, can't keep their hands off each other. That's very unique to the two of them. Rachel's family is also very cool. And Rachel's whole family says that she's glowing. She's got this glow, and it's just very special. One thing to note about Rachel's dad is that he says, what do you know about her besides the exotic locations that you guys have traveled to? What do you know about her dreams? What about when Rachel wants to go to Europe for a year for pilot stuff? And Clayton basically says, I love that she's independent and I like am happy to kind of like accommodate my life around her. It was a decent answer. And the dad asked some really good questions. The dad also used the metaphor when he was talking to Rachel that he said, you want someone to stand with you and not in front of you. That is a lovely metaphor. Lots of tears. Oh, man. So the rose ceremony happens. Clayton in the diary room, so not to the women, says that he's falling in love with all these women in a different capacity and he doesn't want to hold back anymore and now he's going to give them his all because they've certainly given him their all. And I said, okay, sure. Like, I'm with you, buddy. That makes sense. So he gives the rose to Susie, Gabby, and Rachel. Serene goes home and... Serene, to note, was the only one who said that she was in love. This is all very subjective, whether you're, like, falling versus in love. It's all just, like, blah, 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 semantics. But Serene was pretty pretty broken up about this, and that was very, very sad. And she said, if loving him is not enough, then what else am I going to do? So, anyways, next week is Fantasy Suites. And episode nine actually is the Women Tell All. Boo. Actually, the women tell all is kind of fun. But I'm going to jump to the fantasy sweeps and then we're going to come back to the women tell all. I have a lot of notes about that. Holy shit. Okay. I'm scrolling and scrolling. Okay. So fantasy suites. So Rachel's up first. And so we have Rachel, Susie, and Gabby. So Rachel goes first. I believe Gabby goes second. And Susie all the while is saying that like, If I heard that he was intimate with other women, it would be like a really tough pill to swallow. I hope that he takes physical intimacy as seriously as I do. And I think it's important in a relationship, but I only do it with people where there's commitment. So if I found out he was intimate with other women, I would be devastated. And I said, now, bestie, I think that you should have been up front with him about that. Like at this point, this is knowledge that is kept exclusively to Susie, you know? But she's kind of giving, like, no room to budge here. But I'm like, if you're going to set this boundary and then not tell anybody about it, then I think you have to be, like, okay with the fact that, like, when you discover or if you discover, well, this is a recap. So when you discover that he was intimate with both of the other women, you have to be ready to leave. So, okay, Rachel... So Rachel is the first fantasy suite during the day. Very strong physical connection. They can't keep their mouths off each other. And so Rachel was nervous about like where Clayton was because she wasn't really getting much from him. And then he finally is like, I'm falling in love with you. And I have been for a couple weeks, but I was just scared. And I haven't felt these feelings in over six years and blah, 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 blah. And then Rachel's like, oh, my God, I finally saw him be vulnerable. This is so nice. And I was like, this is the first time that you've seen him be vulnerable in these, like, several weeks? That might be a red flag for Clayton. So the morning after, it's we're, like, getting the connotation that they had sex. And they both said that they love each other, L-O-V-E, back in the room. Gabby and Susie are talking. And Gabby's like, I want him to explore the other relationships fully. And then I want him to purposely choose me. So I expect him to go to the fantasy suite, like, with all of us. And then Susie's like, nah, like, I do not feel the same. And I wonder if he's in love with any of us or in love with all of us. And if he feels like it's me at the end of this and then proceeds to sleep with another woman, I would have a really hard time moving forward. And I was like, girl, I still feel the way I feel. And I also don't agree with your stance in the first place. I also don't know if I think this is, like, a to each their own type thing because... Everyone has their own relationship 
to sex. And so I don't think it's fair to hold him to your standard of like what sex means. And I also think that this is a unique situation where you are on The Bachelor. Like if it was a real world scenario and you were like getting to the point where you're starting to say, you know, I'm falling in love with you. Like I'm dating this woman. It is totally reasonable to expect that they would not be sleeping with other women. I'm sure at some point you would have had a discussion about that, about like the level of seriousness in your relationship or the level of exclusivity, assuming that you're doing like a monogamous relationship, which The Bachelor assumes. So it just like, I don't know. I was not a big fan of Susie during this. So then Gabby is the second fantasy suite and Clayton is all like, we started off slower, but I love the momentum that we have. And I made a note about the theme here being that the bar is just so low for like what they want out of a part, like what the women want out of a partner. And Clayton is just like, he's just like hitting the bare minimum across the board. And they're like, oh my God. So it is also alluded to that he and Gabby have sex. They say they were intimate with each other. Like Clayton eventually clarifies this, but He's also basically telling these women that, like, they are the one. Like, he loves them. He's loving them. And I have, like, loved you for a long time now. I've been falling in love with you. It's not just today. And uh, this is why they're going to be upset with you. Because you got emotionally intimate with all of them. So, Susie. She's spiraling emotionally. And she's also on a spiral staircase. Big shout out to the producers. And then it's her fantasy suite time. During the date, Clayton tells Susie that he loves her. And then she's like, do you feel the same way about another woman? Have you slept with another woman? It would be impossible to move forward with an engagement if you had. And I said, okay, like props to you for being upfront about this before you like went to the fantasy suite for the night. But Clayton's like, you said that we should explore relationships and you don't want to be the default. Like you want to be chosen. So I'm like really confused. And yes, I have slept with another person and expressed other feelings of falling in love. And so then Susie's like, if you feel like you're falling in love with me, it doesn't make sense to sleep with someone else. Clayton says, I didn't expect to fall in love with several people, but all of the feelings are different. Susie says, if that were the case, I would have hoped that would have been your action. Like if it were the case that you were in love with me, that it would not be your action to sleep with other women. This got kind of confusing but Clayton's like, I don't want to give up on this. Susie's kind of like wrestling with the fact that she's like not into it anymore. She's like, I, this isn't what I want. Like, like you have, have crossed a boundary for me. I, or it's something that's like not in alignment with my expectations. And that's like not cool with me. Right. And I was like, okay, like Susie, you've said what you have to say, like leave. But then she starts being very wishy-washy. She's like, I don't want you to cut your experience short. Like, I don't want to give you an ultimatum. But like, bitch, you're giving him an ultimatum. You're like, I'm going to give you this ultimatum. Except like the ultimatum has already is already in effect because he already was intimate with the other women and said that he loved them. So like now she just needs to take action on the ultimatum, which is to fucking leave. And it just took forever. She was wishy-washy and here and there. And Clayton's like, I want to fight for this. And she's like, I just feel like I would have needed someone who would have thought through this. And Clayton's like, relationships are hard. Like, it's working through hard times. And then Susie's like, I hear you. I feel terrible, but I just don't think I can get through this. I think she's being wishy-washy because she's a little confused and she really didn't expect this to happen. But it was just, it was a mess. And then Clayton rightfully is like, why wouldn't you have told me earlier about this if you felt so strongly that like I shouldn't be intimate with the other women and how can you do this after all we've been through like have after all this how can you just like leave this and honestly I agree with Clayton here and then Susie walked away and I'm on Clayton's side with the sex thing I do the saying that he loves these other women mm, it is dicey like I don't I I can't imagine what it's like to be Susie and have a man say to you or have like a potential significant other say to you I love you but I also love these other two women and like who knows what's gonna happen I don't know but yeah my feelings for you are real like 
I think he just has really strong feelings for all these women. And he eventually corroborates that in, like, the, whatever it is, the recap something or other. He's like, "Mm, you know, maybe I didn't love all these women. I just, like, thought I did. And so it was irresponsible. He doesn't, actually, he doesn't, we'll get into it, we'll get into it. So in Susie's wishy-washiness, she says, it feels like this is ending. And Clayton says, because you ended it. And Susie says, Clayton, you've like decided that I'm leaving. And then Clayton's like, because you're ending it. Like she is making it clear, but then not leaving. And and then Clayton, actually, he kind of spills here. He's like, I believe everything happens for a reason because of my faith, which is like to eat your own, whatever. But he says, eventually I'll find someone who will stick through it and fight for me. And you're not that person. And that's just it. And I thought that he handled this situation really well. I think that he stood up for himself. And I think he said things that were true. And then Susie's like, in the confessionals, I thought he would have been better at getting through this conversation kindly. And I just disagree. I think that he gave her every opportunity to do the right thing and leave. And she just kept being wishy-washy and saying all these things. And it was just confusing. So, episode 11, week 10. This is the, I think this is in the finale. Is this the finale? Okay, this is the finale. This is the finale. I have many, many notes. So I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to be quick. So this is post Susie leaving, but he did just be intimate with both Rachel and Gabby and said that he loved both of them. Clayton is talking to Jesse, the host, who has been irrelevant since the beginning of the show. And he says, I have no trust. My walls are back up. Like, how am I going to move forward with the other women? I think I just need to be 100% honest with them. And uh, I'm shattered into pieces. I'm questioning everything. And uh, so now he's talking to Rachel and Gabby. And he admits to them that he is in love with both of them and was intimate with both of them. And... uh, I don't know who will be on the other end of this, but I just want it to be one of you. And so naturally, both of the women are like, what the fuck? And they walk away. And this was like all the teasers that had been shown all season of like the rose ceremony from hell and like the them walking away and crying and sobbing. And like, how could he be in love with both of us? And just crying and crying and crying. Like he also says at this point that he loved Susie and he's like heartbroken that she left and they're like what am I supposed to fucking do like you're saying that you love me but you're also saying you love these other two women and one of them's not even here and like this doesn't really feel like you're choosing me the way that they want to be chosen so Gabby's on the fence and she kind of wants to leave and she asks Clayton you know what happened with Susie why isn't she here And exploring relationships is not like loving another person and loving several people. And I was like, oh, true. And then Clayton's like, I'm sorry that this is what it came to. He just like talks about this like it was just like he couldn't help it. It was inevitable for him. And Clayton is like, ultimately, whoever I pick at the end is the one that I love the most. It just means I had a like stronger love with someone else, which like, "Mm, sure, we'll take that. And uh, Gabby's like, that's still kind of fucked up because, like, if I'm not the one at the end, then, like, what am I supposed to do? Just stop loving? And aside, Gabby says that I don't think you can just say that to multiple women and expect there to be no consequences, which is definitely the attitude that Clayton has throughout the rest of this episode is that, like, his love was just inevitable. And so thus, because it's love and he couldn't help himself, he need not face any of the consequences or he doesn't deserve the repercussions of like Gabby and Rachel being upset with him or Susie. Like Susie has the complication with the sex thing, but like the love thing, everybody here is on the same page that it's fucked up for him to say this to them. And then Gabby says, love isn't measured. That was the wrong fucking answer to say that like whoever you love most is the one that you'll choose. And she's like, I don't want to be the one who's loved most. I want to be loved for who I am. And Gabby was just, she was just eating it up. So to Rachel, also in tears, she is like, how is what we have special? 
And Clayton says that the love that he has for her is different than Gabby. And this isn't over unless you feel like it needs to be. Like, I'm here fighting for this. And it's up to you to decide if you want to, like, fight for it too. And if it's worth fighting for because I love you either way. And Rachel's like, I'm scared. It's tough. Like, I feel like our love is worth it. But I don't think I could handle it if we broke up, right? And uh, Clayton's like, can you trust me to take it day by day? And she says, yes. And she's like, I just love him. Like, I love him so much. It hurts so bad. And so, so Rachel is in for continuing the show. At this point, I think it's unfair to ask both of them to stay. And I think he owes it to them to, like, pick somebody now. And if he can't, like, I don't know, man. It's just not fair to them. So Rachel, so he, he gets both of the women back upstairs for the, to, like, complete the rose ceremony, the formality of it all. And uh, Rachel accepts the rose. Gabby does not accept the rose. And then Clayton is like, Shalene, please. He makes like a big Hail Mary ass pitch. And uh, Gabby decides to stay after a lot of back and forth. Because Gabby's like, I don't want to feel like I'm being measured against another partner. Like that just hurts. Why can't you just say you're sorry or something? And Clayton's like, is your heart telling you to walk out the door? Like, shut up. And Gabby's like, I can't do this again. And uh, Rachel then is also justifiably upset because she's like, I'm the last one here, not because he chose me, but because the other women did not choose him. So that feels bad for her. So then (sighs) Gabby walks back up. Gabby and Rachel have a cute little friendship, as we know, because they're now co-bachelorettes. And Gabby is like, I'm sorry to make you wait, Rachel. Rachel's like genuinely like, are you okay? It's very, very cute. They're like really checking in on each other. And speaking of Rachel being like, he didn't choose me. Like how the fuck is he supposed to feel now knowing that Clayton chased her out basically and begged her to come back? Like you weren't a good enough option on your own. At this point in the episode, we get some feedback from some Bachelor alumni, including Peter, Michelle, who was the originator of Clayton. Clayton was on Michelle's season and Claire. And Peter basically like gives Clayton the benefit of the doubt and says like, I think he had good intentions, but didn't consider the position of power that he's in as the bachelor. And it would have gone a long way for him to put on his empathy hat. And like Peter spilled here. I think he really did. Michelle says there's no rule book for this, but there's responsibility and effort that needs to be put in and vulnerability and intimacy is a dangerous game. Blah, blah. Okay, so then now we get dates with Clayton's family. So Gabby's up first and even actually before Gabby comes in, Clayton is un- like disclosing the situation that's happened to his family and his family's like, you screwed the pooch on this one. Like, you, what is, what is this? But regardless, he brings Gabby in. Mom and dad really, really, really like her. They respect that she was like willing to walk away, but that she also chose to came back, chose to come back. The vibes are just very, then Rachel meets the family. Also very good vibes. And overall, it went very well. The family then is reflecting and they say, you know, I can see you with either one of them because they're both great. And then Clayton drops a fucking bomb and he says, All this didn't stop me from thinking about Susie. And I just threw my laptop off my fucking lap at this point because Jesus. So now we're getting a monologue from Clayton and he's saying that he feels love with both Rachel and Gabby, but his art is also out beyond the walls with Susie. And uh, actually, this was not in a monologue. But he's basically saying, like, the love that he has is more special with Susie. And his mom says, but she left you. And then Clayton says, it's not that simple. And the dad says, yes, it is. And the dad is right, in my opinion. Like, I don't know. I'm all for giving love a second chance. But, like, she made the decision. And so, like, it's not on you. Because Clayton's asking, like, acting like it was that he was the one who, who, like, called it off. But that's not true. She made the choice. And he was like the dad and the mom were like, once someone walks away, they're like, it's done and it's finished. And the mom is like, you messed it up. 
and you have to take accountability for those actions. So if you really like think she's such a once in a lifetime woman, like you shouldn't have treated her the way you did. And he shouldn't have treated any of these women the way he did. And then the spill of the century comes. Susie is still in the country that they're in, which is in Iceland, which I didn't mention. And Clayton's like, I just want closure with Susie. Like, I just want to see if we can still do it. And then we get some more Bachelor alumni input. We get Caitlin, Rodney, and somebody else. But Caitlin says that he's just the victim of being in the moment too much. And he's got to take the risk now with Susie if he wants to. And then Rodney says, maybe think before you speak. And I think Rodney was the most upfront here. Just being like, you weren't very considerate. Peter beat her on the bush a little bit. Okay, we have a second episode of the, of week 10. So Susie decides to come back. And uh, this ends up actually being like a Susie redemption. So during the situation, I was fully and completely on Clayton's side. Well, I was half on Clayton's side. But now this turns into like a Clayton is just groveling. I'm sorry I made you feel that way. I didn't mean it when I said I didn't know who because I was looking at you and I saw myself losing you and I was scared and it went way out of character and the second you walked out I lost everything. Please give me a second chance. And then Susie's, you know, I'm not ready to make a decision about this now. I don't know where I stand. So she's just still being wishy-washy. Like you showed up. But you're not sure. Like I think they both owe it to each other to figure out how they feel and stop giving each other these like half answers because they don't need to say like, yes, I love you or yes, I still love you. But they need to say like, I'm willing to try to work this out or not. Like that's it. So now we have some of the best TV I've ever seen in my life. Clayton telling Rachel and Gabby that he actually does not love them. And I thought that I could give my love to three women and then I realized I need to give one woman 100% of my heart and it's neither of you. It's actually Susie. And then Gabby leaves. She says, I have nothing to say to you. I know that was hard, but you're too late and you could have thought about it before before now and maybe you could have considered putting yourself in our shoes. And then she leaves. And then Clayton, this is where Clayton's arc just like really starts sinking He follows her and then tries to, like, make her not upset with him. Like, he doesn't think that she has a right to be upset. This is, like, back on that thing, like, where he doesn't think his actions have consequences because they were motivated by love. And (coughs) honestly, Gabby fucking spills every ounce of tea here. She's like, I don't know who you are or She was like, I don't know who you are at all. I'm pissed because I just spent the last two days away from my friends and family who actually give a shit about me and stayed here because you wanted to try this relationship. And clearly, like, you don't care about me and I can't believe anything you said. And last time it was my decision to leave and you didn't want it to be my decision. But now it's your decision for me to leave. And maybe you don't even have the insight or experience to realize that. And I said period like she just read him for fucking filth and uh, she also noted that she was like all these hard decisions that you're telling us like her and Gabby and Rachel you're telling us as a group not even one-on-one so they don't even have like the space and the vulnerability to like express the way they feel during those moments and Clayton's all like I hear you and I'm sorry and I'm like, if you hear her, like, leave. Respectfully exit. And then he asks to walk her out, and she's like, no. And he left Rachel back in this room. Again, like, chasing Gabby and leaving Rachel with dust. And it's just, oh. So then we get perspective from Gabby live at the finale. She says, it makes more sense now, but it's still disheartening. And... uh, I loved the person that I was presented, but there was a lot about, like, Clayton that I didn't know. So then Clayton comes on stage, and he could not even look her in the eyes. It was, mm, 
Gabby says that she feels like she was Gabby says that she feels like she was misled and she wasn't given all the info, even though he had it, which is that he loved these other women or that he was whatever. And uh, he should have given her that when she was making decisions about whether or not she wanted to stay. Clayton apologizes because he feels terrible and he doesn't have any malicious intent and he didn't go about it in the best way. And then Gabby says, I never thought you were malicious, but I gave you chances to be honest. You said you were being transparent, but your transparency had conditions. Boom. Like you knew how you felt about Susie and you did not tell me that. And Clayton's like, I thought that like it could change on the fly, you know? And Gabby says, loving someone means taking responsibility to protect and care for someone. And you didn't do any of that. I believe you have deep feelings, but your words have meaning and your actions didn't line up. And like, I'm reading this verbatim because Gabby just like truly read. Like she just, oh, she just said such good shit. So after Gabby just like tears him a new asshole, we go back to Clayton and Rachel when he returns from trying to resolve whatever with Gabby. And Clayton says... And Rachel says, you asked about our definition of love. Like, I felt a real intense love, and I felt so uniquely and especially in love. Then with what you put us through at the rose ceremony, like, you said that you were willing to fight. I was the only one who chose to stay. I fought, and, uh, like, I gave you everything, and you never once fought for me. You didn't give me anything, and I was, like, grasping at straws of what you had given me. And she's like, this is going to haunt you. The fact that you let me go, like, you're going to regret this one. And uh, it's it's sad. I remember I wrote that it's hard to watch. Like, he walks her out, and she's like, you're really going to put me in this car right now. Like, you're going to put me in this car to go home. Mm, it's sad. And then, Ra- and then Rachel notes that Clayton didn't even shed a tear. He was never in love with me. At least I have an answer now. So then we pick back up with Rachel live and she has just watched this back, you know, presumably with us as we're watching through the episode. And she's like, I feel like I watched myself just get blindsided and just complete and blatant disrespect. He couldn't even break up with us separately. And I feel like I was robbed the opportunity to actually stand up for myself because I was begging for him not to put me in the car. And she says she would have fought till the end and she like had really true honest love for him but not anymore so then Clayton comes on stage to join Rachel and Jesse Jesse the host and Rachel also tears him maybe a new urethra hole this time she's like none of these emotions are for you or about you I have no lingering feelings because I came collateral damage in your journey for love And that was the most completely selfish journey. You had no empathy for us. And Clayton apologizes, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, it hurts me to see you in pain like this. I should have taken a step back and and checked in. And he kind of like reused what he said to Gabby in the earlier bit. And Rachel just says, I don't believe you. At this point, we also get a gem from the audience. Jesse prompts Rachel's parents if they have anything to say. And Tony says, her dad, Tony, says, we don't have anything to say because none of it's good. Clayton apologizes to the parents. Who cares? Okay, I think we're back in Iceland. And Clayton buys a ring. And he thinks he owes it to both of us to let Susie know how I feel. And I think that that's a selfish take. I don't think they should really be together because, like, they worked through a fight. Like, that's normal stuff. But... The way that it resolved was like Clayton taking all of the responsibility for the situation. And as I've explained, I think each he and Susie were in the wrong in different ways. Or they each have things to own up. Okay. So Clayton bought a ring. They end up at the altar. He pre-reveals it and says a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Ugh. At this point, I was just not rooting for them. And uh, then I think Susie rejects him. She's like, I don't feel like the love I have for you is the same as the love you have for me. 
and I'm going to leave Iceland alone. Even though it's devastating, I don't think I'm your person. And then we pick back up with Clayton live and the finale. And Jesse says, did you feel like you failed? Which I feel like is a weird question. I don't remember completely why, but like, I don't know. I just feel like of all the things that you ask, like, that was a weird one. Anyway, so they tease us and they're like, someone reacted. They tease us here with like, someone reached out to Clayton. And surprise, it's Susie. And I wrote, bro, who cares? Go home. I'm not happy about this. Wishy-washiness continued. So Susie comes back and she says that she left Iceland because she was protecting herself and she didn't know what she wanted. But now they've relayed the foundation. And then she says, that's my boyfriend. Her and Clayton are like dating. And they're together. They're together vibes. And it was just like, nobody wanted this. Obviously, like their relationship connection can and should exist despite what anybody else thinks. But it just was a horrible ending. It sucked. Now for the next season. Whoa, 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 wait. Let me go to the women tell all. Before we lay this lay this to rest, I think we ought to talk about the rest of this stuff. And I think I'll skip some of this that's like not interesting because I took a lot of notes. It was a Shanae hate parade. I was throwing, I was joining in the in the Shanae hate parade. One thing that was funny is during the Women Tell All, they play clips from the show that have not aired yet. Like they have not aired the show at the time that they record the Women Tell All. And so the women, for the first time, see Shanae describe how she was completely faking her apology to them and said, like, give me the Oscar. But then she continued to deflect, like, and just start saying, like, everyone else is fake. And, like, it was just... <sighs> On the flip, Cassidy, who was a flop in the beginning of the season, didn't really own up for her actions. She said stuff like, I didn't do it perfectly, and I didn't realize I was rubbing people the wrong way. And the other women tell her like it is. They're like, you were disrespectful. You treated it like a game and you knew what you were doing. And then she just denies. So during the Shanae hate parade, the fucking host, Jesse, pulls Shanae up to like the center of the stage and says, obviously, it's hard for you to get a word in. And I was like, can we stop giving her a platform? Because, like, this is exactly what she wanted. You're rewarding her trifling behavior yet again. And it's just silly. And then she tries to paint herself as the victim. She's like, I finally had the confidence and I applied for The Bachelor. And shut up. Like, you've been a bad person. (laughs) Throughout the rest of this, the host continues to give Sinead the benefit of the doubt which she just absolutely does not deserve because she has admitted to lying. Shanae also makes a comment here about women who use like filters on like Snapchat or Instagram or what have you. And that's another out of pocket red flag comment. Like what other women do and how they present themselves online is just like none of your business. Like if they are posturing, like that's how they really look all the time. Then like, we get into some dicey area around around like the beauty standards but she said this like oh like that's so embarrassing that they like are not like confident enough to just like put their bare face like that's that's so like victim blaming energy you know it's like oh they're insecure that's embarrassing for them we also get sarah miss young gal on the hot seat and uh, Oh, the thing I didn't clarify from earlier, when she talked about crying with Clayton, it actually turned out that that was a lie. And so that was why Clayton sent her home ultimately, because she was exaggerating the seriousness of their relationship. And that's why it was like manipulative, because then they're presuming that she was doing that so that the other women would feel like they didn't have a chance so that she had a better chance. Next hot seat, we have Teddy. Teddy was like the the instant flame connection. 
this was sad to watch because Teddy was crying a lot and it was just sad. And it made me realize like, this is really sad to think about people like developing real feelings and just getting their heart broken. She also, she had some good reads of the show. She said that she has trouble trusting men and she doesn't feel worthy of love. And she's just always wanted to be perfect and get straight A's and like play the sports that her dad liked. And she felt like she wasn't worthy of love without it. And so because of this, she ended up in a lot of toxic relationships where she didn't feel like she was enough. And she said this show made her feel the same way where she had to try to earn attention. And when she fell short again, it just was like really, really hard. Like the framework of this show is just like rife with pain. And then she also talks about the pressure that is put on women to like change and become a different person when they lose their virginity. And she just doesn't feel like that's right. And she thinks that like waiting until marriage or having sex all the time doesn't matter. So she wasn't like a purist saying like everybody should be waiting. She was like, it is every woman's and every person's decision. And then she revealed that Clayton's brother slid into her DMs and she did not reply. Next we have Clayton in the hot seat and he says he doesn't have any regrets. He did the best with what he had, which sure, that's true. But he says he can't regret it because he had the best intentions at the time. And this is the first time he acknowledges that there are repercussions for those actions, even though he has been like rejecting those repercussions left and right. And I just want to say like, you can have regrets. Like you can say, I did the best with what I had and that, and that can be true. And you can also say like, I regret the way that I like made these other women feel. And I, I regret my actions and behaviors. And so I'm using those as like learning opportunities. I think the like vernacular around regret is just where people are like, I don't have any regrets, like just learning moments or like lessons. Like I have no regrets, just lessons. Like you can have both. Like just saying that you don't regret stuff is just like a semantic thing. Okay. That's kind of it for the finale. And then we get the teaser of the next season that it's going to be Rachel and Gabby. And I just want to say that I fucking called it because I was like, they were dread. And I think that they absolutely deserve it. But then I said, hold up. Why the fuck is it the same season? They like were, had a very supportive relationship, but I'm like, both of them said they don't want to be competing with the same guys. And now they're about to do just that. So anywho, that is it for this recap of Clayton's season of The Bachelor. Now I'm going to be diving headfirst into Gabby and Rachel's season. And you better believe that I'm going to be itching for these red flags. So, yeah. Let me know what you think of this. This is my first run. So if you liked it, engage. Come on. You see the views. It's low. Thank you. And I'll see you next time.